The title of tonight's sermon is Forsaking the Assembly of Ourselves Together. Forsaking the assembly, Assembling of Ourselves Together. Unfortunately today, Christians have become accustomed to skipping church. They don't prioritise church. They don't think it's important. I don't know if it's that mentality that, yeah, I'm saved and that's all that matters. Or the importance of church is not being preached upon enough. Now, I've categorised three main reasons why I think people don't go to church. This obviously doesn't include a recent birth or illness. Or I've also included um, new believers not knowing any better yet. Um, so the number one type of person who doesn't go to church this is probably the one that infuriates me the most is people who don't go to church because, or a certain church because of the church's minor doctrines. They don't fit their beliefs. These people like to compare churches with churches. Churches overseas, churches interstate. They want it to be more closely to what they believe. They, they want the belief, such beliefs as like the sons of God, dress standards, musical instruments, giving, etc. to line up perfectly with what they believe. And they'll forsake sem- the assembling of ourselves together because of such things. I've witnessed this. I've seen it through not sight, or I've seen it through sight, through talking to and fro, but people actually do forsake church over these issues and they forsake a certain church and instead they don't find another church. This is a weak excuse for not going to church. There used to be a time when preachers preached that there were three main reasons for going to a certain church. If you were to pick a church, there would be three main reasons where you base you going to that church upon. Obviously one is salvation, salvation by grace through faith alone. Right? <coughs> Not of works, not some sort of lordship, salvationless, not repent of your sins. No, it's all by faith. It's all by grace alone. Two is the King James Bible. That's obvious. The King James Bible is the word of God. It's preserved throughout eternity. Now, the third is soul winning. If, if there is no soul winning program, but the church isn't against soul winning, so like that was... They won't think it's pointless or anything like that because there is churches these days, even Baptist churches, that sort of step away from going soul winning because it's like a Jehovah Witness thing or something like that. But if it hasn't, it hasn't got a soul winning program, start one up at that church, right? But they're the three main reasons. This was preached a lot years ago. I haven't heard that preached in a while now. Now, all of a sudden, these churches have to have certain minor doctrines all in one accord with other churches. So even though they're independent, you've got to have certain minor doctrines that you believe that this is, way, this is how you've understood the Bible, the preachers understood the Bible, to line up with certain others, to get people to go to your church. right? And unfortunately, these are a growing amount of people who don't go to church for this reason. And this is, if this is you, this is a shame, shame on you. Right? Stop being so prideful. Now, you know one of my minor doctrines is not forsaking the assembly. But I guess that's not on their list, is it? Uh, Number two, that was number one type of person for not attending church. Number two is people who don't prioritise God's church at all. They're lazy people. They're conformed to this world. Something else, something else is always more important than church. doesn't matter how little it is, it's always more important than church. They come up with stupid excuses and they should just say, I want to tread underfoot the Son of God. Number three, and then the third type of person, no, uh, no Bible-believing churches in a far radius. Unfortunately, there's a very small amount of these people in Australia. Like we're, our brother Tim travels if I'm not correct, an hour and 15 to get here? An hour and a half to get here? And he still comes to this church, right? So this is not really an excuse unless you're living on a, in a remote desert. I know Australia's full of desert. There's not many people that live there. So it's a very small amount of people who don't go to church because there's not one in their area. So we use an hour and a half as 
as the example. So, firstly, what is church? So, because the Bible teaches as an important factor in our Christian development, we have to know what it is. So, if you turn, oh, I'm taught, I'm going to be preaching as if you're going to be opening the Bible to where I say. So, turn to Ephesians 4.12. If you can turn to chapter, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, and I'll show you what church is. In Hebrews 2, in Hebrews 2 12, saying, I would declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church, will I sing praise unto thee. In Psalms 22, 22, it says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. So the old, the New Testament uses the word church to describe the believers as the congregation. The Old Test, it inter, these are parallel passages that intertwine one with the other from the Old Testament, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The in, inter, interchanges church and congregation there. So this obviously is telling you that church is not a building also. So we're not, these four walls and roof isn't the church, which I thought was so when I was when I was Catholic. They used they used to teach that like I'm going to church as the physical building, right? So if you you should be in Ephesians four twelve, Ephesians four twelve, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. I've highlighted three. Oh, hang on, I've highlighted three. Phrases there from that verse. For the perfecting of the saints. The, the church is for the saints, which is us. For the believers, to make them complete or whole, spiritually. That's what perfecting, that's what you ought to strive to be. The perfecting of the saints is to make whole, to be made whole or complete spiritually. For the work of the ministry is a second phrase there. That we do the work of the Lord which Christ has instituted as the head of the church. Church, we should be taught what the work of the Lord is, but we should be taught to preach the gospel, we should be taught to go out soul winning, we should be taught all the other, the law of the Bible, but it's for the work of the ministry. For the edifying there, I've highlighted edifying of the body of Christ, that we become wiser in what we believe. In the word of God, we're instructed and taught from the bishop or preacher. So we're meant to become wiser. Num verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the statute of the fullness of Christ. I've highlighted three more phrases there. The unity of the faith, that we, all made, that we are all unified or made one in what we believe as an independent church. Not as one church or a group of churches or a so-called movement. That we are an independent church and we're made one in the unity of the faith. Knowledge of the Son of God there. Knowledge. Knowing the Word of God to a greater extent. And the Word of God is Jesus Christ. He's the Word. So we know, by knowing Him, we know the Word of God more. And I've highlighted there perfect unto a perfect unto a perfect man, which is which I went through in uh, in verse twelve. We should make, be made whole or complete spiritually. In verse fourteen, it says that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men. And cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. We are commanded to be no more children. We are, we are not to be as immature as what children are. The Bible says that we should be made adults spiritually. So we're not tossed to and fro with doctrine. If you're, if you're believing in new doctrines, ones that just come and go, it's obviously something that's, that's not from the Bible. It's not correct. If it comes in and goes, if it's, if it's new, then it's obviously not correct. But if people have been debating over different minor doctrines for years, but if it's something that's just all of a sudden this new 21st century doctrine, 
It's obviously not from the Bible. If this happens, it's because you don't know your Bible. You are not around like-minded believers. You are not hearing God's word week in and week out. We have only one service a week. Other many IFB churches have three times that amount a week. You need to be here for the perfecting at least once a week, right? We only have to be here for a couple hours a week. We, we, we come to be edified, to be perfected, and to do the work of the ministry. You don't want to be believing in strange, unknown doctrines. So get, get to church to be edified. The cunning, and I've highlighted the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. There are people out there with the intent to deceive you. They are preying on babes in Christ. We can see this from babes in Christ or new believers or even long-time believers that haven't grown in the faith. You can hear by what they say that they are not steadfast in the faith. Do you listen to other preachers? If, the, if, these, preachers, if these preachers tell you that the KJV is not perfect, that soul winning is not important, that you have to repent of your sins, live a good life, lordship, salvation, whatever. What if their arguments are detailed and convincing? If you're not going to church or not being edified, do you have the knowledge to be steadfast in the faith? Can you reprove these, reprove these people, rebuke them from what you've learnt? Or are you just going to sit at home and not learn anything? There are wolves out there. Protect yourselves in church, the congregation. By speak, in verse 15 there, <clears throat> by speaking the truth in love, that we, that we uh, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. I've highlighted grow up in all things. Don't stay as children spiritually. We are told to grow up in all things. This includes doing the works and being edified. The head... Even Christ. Christ is the head of the church. He's our final authority of the faith. You turn to Hebrews 10.15. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 15 and put one finger in Colossians 1.16. Hebrews 10.25. Chapter 10 verse 25 and put one finger in Colossians 1.16. I'll continue reading in verse 16 from Ephesians. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. As, a, as the congregation, we are the body of Christ on earth today. At church, we should be unified all together for the perfecting of the church. When one member of the church suffers, we all suffer. The Bible says that the, the Bible says that Christ purchased the church with his blood. His blood is why we are saved, but it's also why we are here, why we are here today, gathered at his, for, uh, by his elect, for his, as his elect. If we are willfully sinning by forsaking the assembly, we are willfully forsaking Christ's blood. Do you appreciate Christ's blood? Do you appreciate what Christ has done for us on the cross? Do you appreciate that Christ was sent to hell for three days to pay for our sins, but also to establish his church? Church is important, guys. It's enough for Christ to die for it. Amen? Of how much in, in, for talk, this is talking to believers in Hebrews 10.29. Of how much sore a punishment suppose ye, shall ye be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted his blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. It's powerful words there in, in Hebrews 10.29. Who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God. In Acts... In... In Acts 
20, 28. It says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseas to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. So you should be in Colossians 1.16. Colossians 1.16, open it up there. Colossians 1.16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. The church was created by Christ, but it was also created for Christ. This congregation of believers, this church, TCIP, was created for our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In verse 17, And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Preeminence means superiority or greatness. There's a multitude of verses in the Bible showing you how important church is to Christ and also how important Christ is for the church. Here's one more. In Ephesians 5.23, this is a famous chapter for marriage, but also for church structure. If you can also turn to Ephesians 5.23, please. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. Talking about marriage and church structure. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the saviour of the body. Christ is the head of this church and he is the saviour of the body which is us. In chapter, in verse 24, Therefore as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So we're subject, this church is subject unto Christ in everything. Everything that we believe, everything that we do comes by him, for him and is subject unto him. In verse, in verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Christ wants to present the church to himself to be a glorious church. We at the church in Punchbowl should strive to present this church without blemish to Christ. That includes the unity, the works for him, keeping, keeping his word our priority and also our authority, but also, but also, and I'm talking about not presenting itself with blem any blemishes. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Now turn to Hebrews 10.23. You should be already there. I told you Hebrews 10.25, but we're going to start in Hebrews 10.23. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Hebrews 10.23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of such is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. The Bible says, is commanding us not to forsake the assembly, which is the church. 
If, if you constantly have excuses not to attend church, you are sinning. The Bible uses the word forsaking there, which means abandoning, departing or desert, deserting. So there's obviously important events in life that warrants you not to be at church. That doesn't mean you're abandoning it or deserting the assembly. As I said before, Christ died for the church. Do you really want to be a person that doesn't appreciate Christ's crucifixion to establish the church? Here, and I've also highlighted as the manner of such is. That's an important phrase there. As the manner of such is. This is saying that there are people who are known for forsaking the assembly. Is this you? Do you choose when you want to come and when you do, don't feel like coming? And it says also at the end of verse 25, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Why? Why should we at church more as we see the day approaching? Well, I'll finish up my sermon on that point because I think it's probably one of the most important points. Verse 26, if we continue on. Verse 26, For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a, fear, a, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fury in, indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. I believe verse 26 is talking about verse 25, because it, it uses the word for to start off verse 26. Four is a conjunction, it's a conjoining word to link up verse 25 with verse 26. So we are talking about willful sinning by not forsaking the assembly. So it's referring to verse 25 there. And also, it's, I've highlighted their sacrifice. People get hung up on this, on this verse, they don't understand it. They, th they will take it in general, that would say if we sin willfully, because sometimes we willfully sin as Christians. That if we sin willfully and we, we should know better and we maybe we sin and then we think, oh, you know, I know that. I, I shouldn't have done that or whatever. People think that they, it's where it says there, there should be no more sacrifice for sins that all of a sudden they've lost their salvation. But it's once saved, always saved. We believe in eternal security of the believer. So obviously that's not the case. The case there is there should be no more sacrifice for sins which is what the old te which links to the old testament so there'll be no more sacri animal sacrifices or any other sacrifice such as animal sacrificing for our sins Christ was the final sacrifice for our sins in so if you can turn to Ephesians 5:19 turn to Ephesians chapter 5 Verse 19 should be there on the screen. Ephesians 5, 19. So, so far I've showed you three reasons why people don't go to church. What church is. I've showed you the, the purpose of church to us. How important Christ is to the church. And how important church is to Christ. All right? Ephesians 5, 19 there. Talking about hymns. The next point why we should be at church. Ephesians 5.19, speaking to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are commanded to sing hymns, psalms and spiritual songs to the Lord. We are giving thanks to him in the name of Jesus. I don't know about you, but I find it hard in my day-to-day -day life if I'm, if I'm going to work or if I'm at home or if I'm going shopping or wherever to actually just break out into hymns. Break out and praise the Lord in hymns, in psalms, in spiritual songs. But when we're at church, we do that. We sing our hymns, we sing psalms, we sing spiritual songs unto the Lord. And we're encouraged to. So this is, this is like, if I don't do it during the week because I'm, my mind's not there and if, I've, if I'm busy with things in life, 
I do it at church. I don't know about you all, but that's that's something that I would struggle with. I would struggle if I was to not go to church to actually keep this commandment. Right? That we're commanded to sing hymns and, and praise him with spiritual songs. So come to church to sing hymns. If, if you're not going to do it at home, be here and do it. My point is that as, as we've done before and we're about to do again, we are singing hymns at church and we're obeying, obeying the word of God by doing so. As I read before in Hebrews 2, Hebrews 2 verse 12, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation, I will sing praise unto thee. I will declare thy, in Hebrews, uh, sorry, uh, Psalms 22, verse 22, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of, of the congregation, will I praise thee. So that's comparing churches before, but it's also say, saying, I will sing praises unto thee, unto God. Now turn to he, uh, Matthew 28, 18. Turn to Matthew 28, chapter 28, verse 18. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. We are commanded by Christ to go out and teach all nations. We are commanded to preach the gospel everywhere and unto every, every human. We are commanded to what we call sowing. We are commanded to do that. Through church, you will get that encouragement. You will get that edifying on how to preach the gospel better, how to outline the best way to present it to a non-believer so they can get saved and call upon the name of the Lord. Jesus said, go. In verse 19, he said, go. You are commanded to get off your behind and do what Christ has commanded you to do. Soul winning is what this church is all about. And what every church should be about. Oh, sorry. I believe that while we are not raptured, the day we called upon the name of the Lord is because we are left to do a great work for Christ. We are left to go out soul winning. We are left to preach the gospel to all the unbelievers. If we, The day that we got saved, we got raptured, it, Christ is possible. God is, He can do all things. If we caught upon the name of the Lord, if we believe, He could have said, that's it, you've, you've fulfilled your purpose in life, you jo- come join me in heaven. He didn't do that. He's left that to another day. So He's left us here with a duty, a command to go. And preach the gospel to every creature. We are meant to get as many people saved as possible. We are not left here to do nothing. In saying this, do you see people out there who go soul winning regularly and don't attend attend church? To tell you the truth, I haven't seen anyone that goes out and preaches the word door by door, week in, week out, but forsakes the assembly. At TCI, I'm proud to say that this is soul winning church and is urged. I tell you, the day you start to forsake the assembly is the day you stop going soul winning. If you, can't, if you can do soul winning and not attend church, then you can definitely do both. In verse 20 of that, of Matthew 28, it says, teaching them, I've highlighted there, teaching them to observe all things. You can compare that with Ephesians 4, with, compare that with the edifying. 
teaching them all things in the Bible. In, in Mark 16, 15, Mark 16, 15, it says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Further down, verse 20, And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following Amen. Acts Turn to Acts 2.42, Acts 2.42, chapter 2, verse 42, and put one finger in Proverbs 13.20. One finger in Proverbs 13.20, and turning to Acts 2, verse 42. Now, I hope these verses prick the hearts of those who think fellowship is not as important to the, uh, as the service is. And if this is you, I hope this touches your heart. Acts 2.42 And they continued steadfastly and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. This should be an example of we, what we should be doing as a congregation of the Lord. We are like-minded believers. We should not be spending more time with unbelievers in fellowship than what we do with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. The Bible says we should be provoking one another, one each, uh, provoking each other in love and good works. Turn to Proverbs 13.20. It should be in Proverbs 13.20. Proverbs 13.20, which is one of my favourite chapters in the Bible, it's just filled with so much wisdom. Proverbs 13, 20 says, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, and but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. If you're fellowshipping with each other constantly, you'll be wise. But if you spend a heap of your time with non-believers or just fools in general, you will be destroyed. I think destroyed there in this context, context, context means that you will make stupid decisions. You will make your life harder than what it ought, ought to be. Right? If you're hanging around with fools, you're going to learn their bad habits. You're going to learn this struggle that we all have in life. You're going to learn their bad habits. That we, you're going to learn how to make stupid decisions. And that sin will find you out. God will punish his the, his sons and daughters in Christ. Be with people, basically, be with people and you will be wise, is what that proverb says. Turn to Hebrews 10.25 again. Hebrews 10.25. You were there before. Turn to Hebrews 10.25. Chapter 10, verse 25. As I said before, I'll be closing with these verses and explain the end of verse 25. Now, I was talking to Kevin a couple of weeks ago, right, and I told him that I was doing a sermon on forsaken the assembly. He thought I'd be doing a sermon on the sodomites. That's my pet hatred in this world, sodomites. So we were having a laugh about me jokingly fitting this in, the sodomites, into this sermon that I was doing. Having a good old laugh about it. And I thought to myself a few days back, and I, I, this wasn't in my original sermon that I was, about, that I was going to preach, that, it, that the reprobates, the sodomites, is actually necessary to preach tonight. You might ask me, Nathan, how can you intertwine these filthy beasts with your personal church attendance? Well, ponder about these questions. Why should we be going to church more as we see the end of days approaching, firstly? Secondly, why should we not be forsaking the assembly today and the days ahead? I'll tell you why. Because we need a sanctuary. We need to be gathered here 
gathered together. We do not want to be forsaking church so you can see more of the filth that is in this world. If you desire after the filth of this world, then don't come to church. It's right outside those walls. It's right outside that door. We are, dis- we are surrounded by these disgusting reprobates more and more as we see the days approaching. It's only going to get worse. It's only going to increase and get worse. You might say, Nathan, but I have to go to a birthday party. Now, you can go to a birthday party and there might not be any reprobates, sodomites there, whatever you want to use for that. But I guarantee you that there won't be any sodomites here. There won't be any sodomites, any reprobates amongst this congregation. So you can be safe here with your like-minded believers, with your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. They belong outside that door. Well, actually, they belong in the ground. Amen. If Victor was to say that he was going to do two two services a week, two services a week, he was going to do a midweek service and he was going to do a Sunday service. You know where I'll be? Right here in the congregation. Why? Because that would be twice the amount of time where I won't have to set my eyes on these filthy perverts out there. So be here. If you can't be here once a week, I'm actually saying if we had two services, be here twice a week. Be here three times, four times, five times. Be amongst your brothers and sisters in Christ so much the more as you see the day approaching. Don't put your eyes on these filthy, wicked people out there. They're everywhere. I was at the train station the other day picking up Brother Lewis. And they're everywhere. I haven't been to a train station in a while. I don't catch public transport. I can't remember the last time I've been there. But they're everywhere. So be here. Be in the congregation. What do we hear from? Well, if you're here to fellowship, then you're here for at least four hours. Yeah, you're at least here four hours. And you won't have to see these wicked things in this world for four hours. And if you sit at home and you're like, oh, well, I'm not going to, if I'm inside these walls of my house, I'm not going to see them in my house, right? But do you watch TV? Every story that has, that's about sodomites is on TV. Why? Because they've got to promote it. And they're using the TV, the radio, to get inside your minds where you think you have a sanctuary. You think, oh, I'm inside these walls. I've got my sanctuary at home, in front of the TV, near the radio, with my wife, with my son. But yet, it's coming in through there, and it's coming in through there, with your eyes and the ears. Because you either got to listen to it, unless you've got no TV, you've either listened to it or hear about it. And if you're in the car, then you'll hear about it as well, because it's on the radio everywhere. If you've got your, your uh, car tuned into FM or AM, It's all you hear about these days. Six o'clock news comes around. Promotion of sodomites. It's always there. Now where I get this sanctuary from, why I believe that the New Testament church should be a sanctuary. In Psalm 20, verse 1 to 3, Psalm 20, verse 1 to 3, the Lord, in verse 1 it says, The Lord hear thee in the days of... In the day of trouble, the name of uh, the name of God of Jacob defend thee. Send thee help from the sanctuary, and strengthen thee out of Zion. Remember all thy offerings, and accept thy burnt sacrifices. Selah. The New Testament church ought to be our sanctuary. Ought to be where we get away from the sick world that we have outside these wars. Now, what is a sanctuary? Well, according to dictionary.com, a sanctuary is a refuge or place or safety from pursuit, persecution or other danger. And if you know your end times prophecy, you know that's exactly what's going to happen to us. So let's use the church today to be a sanctuary and not maybe in the future where we think we've got to flee evil men. Let's use it today. Let's get to church today. 
Let's get to church next Sunday. Let it be our sanctuary. It was there. Sorry about that. I've put change. Okay. The church is my time to be with God's people. To sing hymns, be edified for the work of the ministry, for the perfecting of the of the for the perfecting of myself, to grow up in all things, to praise the Lord, to have fellowship, and to become a better soul winner. But you might say, Nathan, I can do most of these things, if not all of these things, and still be a wise and edified Christian. I'll answer this with a rhetorical question. Can you do all these things and not sin by forsaking the assembly? Can you do all these things and not sin by forsaking the assembly? And if you're sinning, you're not wise in your sin. Guys, let's appreciate what Christ has done for us through his death, through his burial, and through his resurrection. How he shed his blood for the church. Let's not turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. Let's not have trodden underfoot the Son of God. Let's not be the manner of some is. Let's not be judged of God by forsaking church. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Be aware. Be aware of the sin of forsaking the assembling of ourselves. If you take anything from my sermon, anything tonight from my sermon, I forgot the last half an hour, but if you take anything from, the, from this sermon, is be aware of the sin of forsaking the assembly. Why? Because it will deteriorate, your life will deteriorate. If you're forsaken the assembly, you're reject, you're not being edified the way you should. You might be reading God's word, but you're not like you're not with like-minded believers. You're not constantly being reproved if you if you think you've found something that that goes contrary to what we believe. So your life will deteriorate. And you'll be less of a perfect man. Not that we'll ever become a perfect man because only Jesus Christ was. But you, you'll actually go into a decline. Now I want to leave you with these three verses and some thoughts. Hebrews, if you can turn to Hebrews 10.29. Well, there before Hebrews 10.29. Chapter 10, verse 29. And how much, in verse 29, how much sore a punishment suppose ye? Shall ye be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace? For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall in, into the hands of the living God. We ought to present this church to Christ, and he wants to. He wants this church to be presented to Christ without blemish. But we ought, we ought to present this church to Christ without blemish. Like forsaken the assembly. Appreciate what we have here. Don't take Christ's blood for granted when he purchased, it, purchased the church with his blood. Also, grow your marriage here. If, you're an Earl, if you are recently married or you plan on getting married one day, grow your marriage here. Be taught the word of God. I remember Victor preaching sermons on this about marriage. And, I go, and, I'm, and, and we're going through the Bible and I'm getting new edification by being in, in, in the service, listening to his word. And I can apply that to my marriage. And if you want to have a biblical marriage, be at church, read your Bibles, but be at church 
so you can hear it preached upon. Now, if you weren't there when he when Victor done these these sermons on marriage, then this applies to you because you forsook the assembly. Now, if you had obviously an excuse that was that would warrant you being at home or not here, it's a different story. Like childbirth, illnesses, sickness of a child, a mother, maybe, etc. I haven't listed them all. But but raise also your family here. Raise the next generation here. We see the little children that are in this church, the little the little Simons, the little Timothys, the little Enochs, the little Ednas, the little Sarahs, the little Jeremiah's, the little Abel's everywhere. The little TJs. So we see him here. The little Gershon. The little, the little Atticuses. I don't know who's this. Oh, there you go. The little Joshua's. The little Faiths. Michael Jr. We, uh, Matea. Who else I left out? <laughs> Anthony's children there too. Sorry, I didn't see Anthony at the back there. <laughs> but raise the next generation here. The next generation should be raised in this building. Unless we send out another like-minded preacher. But it should be at church too. Obviously it should be at church if, if for some reason this church is not here. It should be at another church. But raise your children in church so they can be edified through His Word. So you can be edified to discipline them also. If you're, if you're not being at church, not being taught how to discipline your children, Victor also preached on this. Then you're not you're not being edified, and you're not you're not going to put your family in a place where you should be edified, where you can be taught how to make them a better ch- child of God, and get them saved. Most importantly, also let's make Victor a full time bishop by attending church in, and giving your offerings. I'm hoping that we give, if we don't give our offerings at church, we give it somehow other way but if you're here and give your offerings if you're here week in week out and this church grows and people stop forsaking the assembly the closer victor gets to becoming a full-time bishop and that's what we need here we need victor to be a full-time bishop so he can prioritize this church the work of god and do more for this church and maybe this church will grow further with victor as a full-time bishop but if we're not here and Victor will stay a part-time bishop. He will stay part part-time and won't ha- won't be able to open up that second uh, that second service that we want, or third, or fourth, or whatever. But if he's a full-time bishop and you're here giving your offerings, attending church, we're that one step closer every week that someone attends church. Be a soul-winning church. If you don't go to church, you're likely not to be soul-winning. Now the question I want to leave you is with. And it's probably what I'm going to preach about the next time I get up here. Right? What would your life be like without the church in Punchbowl? What would your life be like without this church? And I hope maybe not, but I had my experiences of not being in a church that was biblically correct. And it's hard to find these days a church that, that preaches from the King James but also preaches by salvation by grace through faith alone, alone, not of works in any way, shape or form. So what would your life be like without the church in Punchbowl? If someday this church was to fail or, or not to live up to this standard and for some reason this church closes or whatever sake, sake it may be. And I hope and I pray that it will never happen because I want to raise my son and my future children in this church. That's my intentions. What would your life be like without TCIP? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we're able to be gathered here today amongst other like-minded believers, Lord, being edified, being made perfect, men or women, being made whole, complete through your word. 
Lord, we pray for all those who came today that their lives may be blessed through this sermon. And also if they didn't come today that they can hear this sermon and they can be edified, maybe their heart pricked to get to church, to come here and be other, around other like-minded believers. Lord, we, we also pray for the little children of this church, that their parents, and also that if their parents intend that, that the children attend this church, the, when the children grow up, that they may stay here and be edified and continue the great work that this church is doing and the greater works that it has to come. Lord, we, we also pray for those who need prayers in the church. We pray for them earlier. Lord, we pray for also um, for, uh, for Elizabeth, that she, that she can come to the church next week and she recovers, maybe not next week or the week after, so she recovers from the recent child, the childbirth. And pray for all those who are sick, and all the children that are sick that haven't come today for that reason. We pray for also me having the opportunity to be up here, Lord, that hopefully I presented your word with boldness and maybe edified these people, Lord, hopefully. So, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be able to get here. And, Lord, I pray for the men of this church, that if there's any other men that have the desire to preach, that they... Man up and get up here and do it. I found out today that it's not that hard. I found out today that you were with me, helping me along the way, Lord. So, Heavenly Father, I present all these things in the precious, perfect, loving name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And also, if anyone has not RSVP'd for fellowship, please, uh, please see me after this service. Please let me know because I can still add to the order. We're getting Chinese barbecue tonight. So thank you for that. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Victor. That's good. He does a great job with the uh, the RSV thing. That's good. I'm really grateful for that. And thanks for the good reminder for church. Just a, cu- just a couple of quick closing thoughts on that sermon. So, yeah, church is so important, isn't it? And um, it's funny because people often talk to me and they ask me questions and they ask me about things and they say, oh, you should preach a sermon on that. And i like, well, I did. You just you might not have been there to, to hear the sermon. But, you know, as our church grows, you know, our church started, it didn't really have that many families because obviously it was a lot of young people. And as we start to have families growing in the church, a lot of you are going to have your first children soon. And we have other families joining. Um, you know, we're starting to build this community here. I hope you start to see, you know, the importance, you know, of your example to the church. You know, because you don't really think about your example because, you know, maybe you you haven't had a family. But once you're part of a church, you have a family, you start realizing the importance of your example to the rest of the church. And that's why us as leaders, you know, we set an example, right? I mean, you know, how, how would you like me to talk? You know, do you want me talking like the world? Do you want me dressing like the world? This is what you've got to think about. You know, how do you talk? Do you swear a lot? How do you dress? Guys, you know, if you're looking in the mirror, you think you're, you look a little feminine, your shoes look a little feminine, it's got to change. You know, same with women. You look at yourself in the mirror. If you look a bit immodest, you know, if it's accentuating your body and you think, hey, this is actually not something that Jesus would want me wearing, that's got to change because it's about your example. You know, what you talk about too. We don't want a bunch of fornicating, drunkard, covetous people at church because we don't want to raise our children in that environment. That's why it's so important what your example is. So if you think about the example you would want me to set, why? Because you want your children to be able to say, hey, look, this is how you want to behave. This is how you want to dress. This is what you should be talking about. This is what your priority should be. You know, what your life is about. Like, my life's not about, oh, you know, I want to go on this holiday. I want to buy this nice thing or I buy this big boat. You know, it's about, hey, I want to live my life so I can be more effective to serve Jesus. You think, hey, I want my kids, you might be thinking to yourself, I want my kids to have that example. Okay, well, I want my kids to have that example too, right? So that's why it's important that you guys are a good example because they my kids, they don't, always, always, they don't always look to their parents, they also look to other people, you know? Sometimes, you know, Sarah might want to be like one of the other girls in church, you know, follow them and admire them. Or Simon might look to some of the other guys in church 
and admire them. You know, we all have to be a good example for each other. That's why it's so important that we have that, that good example. And uh, the other thing is, yeah, like a uh, great point, you know, this the sermon is about, you know, not forsaking the assembly, the importance of church. And what I want to get you guys to think about as well, just a lot, one last quick thought is, <coughs> you don't want to get into this idea that just because you're here listening to the preaching that you've done church. Does that make sense? It's like people have this idea, it's like, you know, I just came for the one hour, because you know, they don't come at five o'clock, right? They come late, right? So they miss out on the singing, they miss out on the Bible reading, they miss out on the prayer, they come for the 45-minute sermon, and then they're like, okay, I've done church. Don't get into that mindset, because obviously church is more than just the preaching. It's about this community that you're a part of. So obviously when you start growing, right, you start learning, desiring the sincere the milk of the word, you, you learn first. And then sometimes in your Christian life, it's up and down, right? So sometimes you're down, you need that encouragement. But what you want to get to is you come to the assembly to serve, right? You're actually a blessing to somebody else. You're helping pick somebody else. You're encouraging somebody else into the right direction and helping to teach them certain things. So that's what you want to be aiming towards. So you don't think, oh, okay, so I'm here, I haven't forsaken the assembly. Because you want to be here and also growing by helping, by serving, getting involved in the soul winning. And you, you're going to get out as much as you put in. You know, for those of you who have been part of this church for a long time, you know you're getting more out of this church because you're here. But not only that, you're involved. You know, you're serving with one another. You're going soul winning with one another. You're making friends. And then that's where church really is a blessing to you. And, 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 and it's, it's a really great thing. Anyways, I have Alex come up and just uh, lead one more song. Thanks, Nathan.